Today's lecture will be, inshallah, informative and useful. I have just returned from a tour to Germany. First time I was visiting Germany as a tour. And so I wanted to explain to you the reality of Islam and Muslims in Germany. As you know, I do these types of series. We talked about Islam in Nordic countries, Islam in Australia, Islam in multiple places. The purpose is so that we broaden our horizons and benefit from their experiences, they benefit from us. We realize the problems and the positives and the negatives and we feel a connection with our ummah across the globe. So a brief summary of uh, this uh, journey that I had and also the reality of Islam in Germany. Germany, out of all of the uh, superpowers of the 18th, 19th century, actually has a unique history. It was the only major superpower that did not colonize a Muslim land. Italy colonized a Muslim land. France colonized. England colonized. Germany did not colonize any Muslim land. In fact, Germany, generally speaking, was far more sympathetic to Islam and Muslims in the 17th, 18th, 19th century than the other superpowers. In fact, they were the ones who invented the term the Orient in order to kind of romanticize the Orient, meaning us Muslims, and to put us on a pedestal. Their most famous intellectual philosopher of the 17th century, Goethe, he actually has a book, if you know your uh, Persian history, the Divan of Hafiz, right? So Goethe, who is the most famous German poet philosopher, wrote a book similar to the Divan of Hafiz, and he called it the East-West Divan. And in it, he praised Islam, and he mentioned that Islam out of all of the religions is the most global religion. So in the 17th century, one of the most greatest minds from this region is actually praising Islam when England and other countries had nothing but disdain for Islam. So from the beginning, generally speaking, the German mindset was more sympathetic to Islam and the Ottoman Empire. And this is actually demonstrated even in political ties. So in the 19th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire actually established ties with Germany. And the German Kaiser, uh, the Emperor Wilhelm II, actually visited Istanbul. So the German Emperor Wilhelm II visited Istanbul 18 and he met with Sultan Abdul Hamid. There's a famous place in Istanbul, if you go there, they constructed an entire mini, uh, if you like, podium, which is still there, one of the iconic sites that you will find. So, the, And there's video footage of the emperor coming because it's 1898, so black and white video footage. And he gave a lecture in which he said, Germany will remain an ally to the 300 million Muslims. Back then, Muslims were 300 million. He literally said, Germany will be your ally. These other superpowers, forget about them. We will be your helpers. And he established a strong tie with the Ottoman Sultan and Empire. And that is why German scholarship about Islam was always radically different than English scholarship. Perhaps some of you don't know this, uh, but even when I went to do my, my PhD, I realized this very early on. The bulk of writings in the 17th, 18th, 19th century about Islam that are even a little bit positive, relatively speaking, are in the German language. And the English language did not have even anything equivalent. And the German uh, uh, Orientalists, back then they would be called Orientalists, were far ahead of their British equivalent. German scholarship on Islam left a mark in the Western Academy that we still feel to this day. On a personal note, when I was doing my PhD at Yale, both of my professors were German. The, as you know, the Ivy Leagues hire the best professors. Both of my Islamic studies professors had studied in Germany, PhD in Germany, and they're brought to America because that level of scholarship, it is difficult to find over here. And they are accomplished scholars in their own fields. So German scholarship about Islamic studies has always been light years ahead this isn't uh, before the modern times, now things have changed, but we're talking about until the 1950s. And in fact, when Nazi Germany came into power, many scholars of Islamic studies fled to Ottoman lands and they took refuge in Ottoman lands. And some of them trained a new generation of Muslim scholars because they were now based in Istanbul and other uh, regions. So Germany therefore has always had a slightly different relationship back in the past. And this is also demonstrated in their converts. A number of famous people from Germany converted to Islam. Of them, uh, somebody by the name of Hugo Marcus, this is in World War II, you probably don't know his name, maybe one day I'll give you a whole talk about him. Hugo Marcus, he converted and he went to the Ottoman side and he fought against his own uh, people. He became an ally with the Muslim Ummah and he called himself Suleiman Al Franconi from Frank. Suleiman Al Franconi is a famous story about him, maybe one day we'll mention that. But all of you know 
one convert from Germany. He has left a mark on the world a hundred years ago. And that is Leopold Weiss, Muhammad Asad. Muhammad Asad, the famous person, uh, all Pakistani should know him. He was the first foreign minister, the first foreign minister of Pakistan, Muhammad Asad, because he took Pakistani citizenship, believe it or not, right? The German convert, he was born in the German lands, spoke German as his mother tongue. Of course, he's Austrian, Polish, German, you know, back then it's all one, but he's German, he's German. And he traveled in Arabia. He interacted with King Abdul Aziz, right? He, at the time, was a non-Muslim. He became very well known in Arabia. He converted to Islam in Arabia. He married a lady from Mecca. He married a lady from Mecca in Arabia. His son, his son is a very famous professor in New York, Talal Asad. So Talal Asad is a famous anthropologist, one of the most famous in the world. His mother is a Makkawi, Makki, and he's Saudi, and his father is a Jewish convert because Muhammad Asad was a Jewish convert. One of the most interesting cases. Maybe one day we'll talk about Talal Asad. That's another case. Muhammad Asad then migrated to Pakistan. He took on Pakistani citizenship. He died in Pakistan. There are interviews that he has from Pakistan because he died in 1981-82. So there's interviews of Muhammad Asad, uh, again, a German convert to Islam. So Germany has always had a very different relationship in this regard. As for German immigration, the Muslims migrating to Germany, this too has a very unique history. After World War II, when Germany, of course, is completely demolished, when they're uh, their male population is dwindling, so they open up a program. They call it guest workers, in the German term, guest workers. They want people to migrate. And because they have close ties with Turkish Ottomans, they actually open the door for the Turks to come to Germany. This is a historic connection that they now open up the door. And so, 1961, they want Turkish people to come and work because they need Workers, they don't have workers. Factories don't have men. They needed people to run the businesses. They need people. So perhaps a million people came. That is a massive number, a million. Those one million, their descendants are now five million or something, six million, like massive amounts. This is in the 60s. So in the 60s, Germany opened the door for Turkish Muslims to come. And because of this, as we're going to come to, large groups of Turkish Muslims came. And now their third generations are in Turkey, are in, are in Germany now. Not their children, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Because this is a migration before America. American migration, you know, took place primarily 80s, some 70s, very few 60s. 80s and 90s is the main migration. In Germany, the migration is one and a half generation before. So when I went to there, the majority of the Turkish Germans that I met, their grandfathers had come. Their fathers and mothers were born in Germany. Their grandfathers had come from uh, Turkey to Germany. So this is the largest group of uh, uh, migrants that have come, and we're going to come back uh, to them. Along with this, in the last 20 or 30 years, Germany has also opened the, uh, the door for migration from other lands, and especially from war-torn lands. And so Afghanistan and Syria, perhaps a million each. Massive, quant the largest group of migration from Afghanistan to any Western country has taken place in Germany. And the largest group of migration from Syria to any Western country has been Germany. And this is recent, i.e. the last 20 years, right? Since the war of the last 25 years, and especially Syria, the last 10 years. So you now have massive populations of these lands. You have smaller uh, pockets as well, and that is, uh, uh, you have also North Africans, Moroccans, you have Bosnians, you have uh, Pakistani Indians, we go everywhere, mashallah, but not like here, we're not, our percentages are nowhere there. In the whole audience there, there were probably less than 5% of uh, our ethnic background, right? So I did miss not having enough biryani when I go over there. Generally, I always make sure I have some biryani. So the Pakistani said, next time you come, we'll take you to our restaurants because there are not as many as the other uh, groups over there. So currently, how many Muslims in Germany? Unbelievable, unbelievable. It is estimated that up to 8% of the country is Muslim. 8%. And... This 8%, as is always the case, you cannot say 8% for the whole country. Cities, the bigger cities, will have what? More or less? More population. I was completely blown away. Hamburg and Berlin, more than 10% Muslim. 
When I was driving down Hamburg, my host said to me, in this one street that we're driving, there are over 50 musallas. 50 in this few miles. One street, one main street. 50 areas to pray. I said, no, no, you got to be 15. No, 50, he said. Frankfurt, which is the hub of international trade, you will be completely blown away. It is estimated 15% of Frankfurt is Muslim. Unbelievable. Again, statistics are, and you see this because everywhere you go, everywhere you go, there are literally like corner stores that are selling halal products, selling stuff from the Middle East. Corner stores that are Afghani in origin or Syrian or Iraqi. Shawarma places everywhere and you know all the different cuisines and all the different people. Everywhere you go in the major cities, you find the presence of Islam very, very clear, very palpable. However, obviously, as with all, there's positives and negatives in each one. And the fact of the matter is that it was eye-opening for me to hear from the German Muslims the reality of life in Germany. There is a sentiment of fear. There is a climate of intimidation right now. Alhamdulillah, I was allowed to go preach there. There are many preachers that are banned for the most trivial reasons, number one. Number two, me, myself, and you know my track record, I'm not involved in anything radical or whatnot. It wasn't about me. We couldn't rent a single university campus or a public hall for my talks. I said, why? Is there any issue with me? No. Everybody is scared to rent to Muslims. The non-Muslims, they don't want to be involved with the Muslim population. Despite the fact we're 15%. But they don't want anything to do with having anything Islamic, anything public to do with Islam. Why is this the case? Let us now deconstruct. And I say this with love and respect to my brothers and sisters in Germany. The goal is to benefit. There's no criticism here. We're all in this together. We want to help each other out. We want to make sure that we learn from you, you learn from us. The biggest impediment that I have seen, 60% of the Muslims are of Turkish origin. And the Turkish masajid are run directly from the government in Turkey. The construction, the imams, the climate, the khutbas. It is as if you're in Turkey. And that community, 60%, is disconnected from the rest of the Muslim groups. They have their own. So in the audience that I came to, a few token Turkish brothers that are involved outside of their groups. Otherwise, I am not going to be in that 60%. And because these masajid are controlled literally by the Turkish government, literally, like there is a department, the Anad Center, which again, it's great they're doing it. I'm not criticizing that. But what's going to happen when the government is going to be directly involved in the masajid? No politics. No khutbah. No, nothing about, you get the point. Like no political engagement. Just pray, go back home, pray, read Quran, do dhikr, go back home. So 60% of the population of Muslims, they're completely disconnected from civic society. In fact, what is even more, like I need to say this a bit bluntly with love and respect, still that's that 60%, many of them don't even want to take German citizenship. They are not German citizens. There's a permanent green card category that this group has. And it's both ways. Members in the government as well don't want them to become citizens. And they themselves, many of them, are very happy because the version that they're being taught is their pride of their ancestry and whatnot. And so there is this limbo. You're neither here nor there because they're not living in Turkey permanently. They visit every few years. They speak the language fluently. This is, by the way, unique. I haven't seen any other country in Europe or in the Eastern, Western world. The third generation is still speaking the language fluently. Only happen with them. Why? Because their communities are bubbles. Their communities are cut off from the rest of the society. So within their community, 100%. Turkish khutbas to this day third generation Turkish the whole ambiance is Turkish which is I guess fine culturally but then what happens with that you are not taught that you are German you are not taught you should be a part of society to do anything with society it's literally you come into the masjid you are 
Islamic, you go outside, you forget about this reality. When you have this mindset, then what's going to happen, right? So the groups that invited me were the other masajid, non because the government control, obviously, I cannot, I'm not from that land, so I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be in that system, right? So who invited me? The masajid that are from the more immigrant community, right? Those who came from Arab lands and some Pakistanis here and they're like that. They're the ones who were active in doing these types of durus and halaqat. So the main issue is that automatically, that 15% we're talking about, more than half of them, they have nothing to do with politics, with the political system, with engagement in public, and they're simply living their lives. Another issue is that the large percentage, even of the other half, are absolute fresh immigrants 10, 15 years ago. A million and a half or two million from Afghanistan and Syria in particular, these two countries. And they came when? 10, 15 years ago. So, do you think they're going to speak fluent German? Do you think they're going to get the top-notch jobs? So then they are fresh immigrants. They are being discriminated against. They don't understand the system. They have come from war-torn zones. And obviously, they're living disconnected lives right now. But there is hope in their children. Some of their own children, now they're in university, they're the ones coming to my lectures. So we have a person, his father came from Syria. Another, his parents came from Afghanistan. The children of that batch... They are now, inshallah ta'ala, they're the ones. They were the main ones who are hosting me now, the children. But this leads me to point number three. And this is something us American Muslims don't understand. Generally speaking, and I say this with love, trying to be factual. I'm not trying to be dismissive. Generally speaking, European Muslims, socioeconomically, are at a different status than American Muslims. Why? Because where did the visas come from in Europe? Who was the visa given to in Europe? To the workers. And in America, who was the primary recipient of visas? Students and skilled workers. Students and skilled workers. The primary, we know this. We all know this, right? This makes a massive difference in mindset and in socioeconomic clout. And I cannot impress upon you the reality of this. Most Muslims in Germany are socioeconomically, not middle class, if you get my point. The majority of them. And this also reflects in education. The people that I told you were third generation, I was shocked. They are the first people to go to university in their line. Their grandfather and grandmothers are workers. Their parents were social, were working menial jobs. It's this generation now that they're just beginning to go to university. The culture of education is not the same as over here. You know, for most of us, our children cannot even think of stopping after high school. It's not even an option, right? Straight to university, it's not even an option. You have to understand that's not the case for most of Europe still. Is still not the case. And this has impact because your socioeconomic clout, your political clout is all going to come with education, with integration. So when the bulk of these 15% are not economically empowered, they're not even some of them speaking German fluently, what is going to happen? And there's not a culture of education, rather there's a culture of isolation, which leads me to another negative. And again, I say this, O oh Muslims of America, we really have a lot of positives we should thank Allah for. When you're living in Europe, when you're living in Germany, for example, America is a land of immigrants. We are all immigrants. And the diversity of languages, skin colors, ethnicities, it's something we use to our advantage. Europe is not a land of immigrants. And when Muslims are the only immigrants, they have a different religion and a different skin color and a different cultural identity. It is very easy for the dominant group because it's only one group and one culture and one skin color and one language, right? It's very easy for the dominant group to put you down, demonize you. We know this in this country that the people that are looked down upon, they're divided into different categories, right? I don't want to be too explicit. Some have to do with 
south of the border, some have to do with the skin color, some have to do with the immigration, some. So the hatred of the dominant group is split amongst multiple people. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Right? The racism is split. Imagine in Europe, in Germany, in France, all of that racism against immigration, against the wrong skin color, against the wrong this, against all of that combined against us. That's the reality. So the reality, therefore, is that that 15%, that 10%, they're not equal to the rest of the 85, 90%. They are living like second class citizens. Education, it's not in your face, but it's not as welcoming. Jobs, you apply and the other person applies this. They said the same thing to me, like the name, the background, that hidden racism, right? That second class citizenship, it is very clear over there. And therefore, this leads me to my next point, one of the most awkward points, but it needs to be said here. When you have a large group of disenfranchised young men and women cut off from the broader opportunities in public, right? What do you think is going to happen to that group in terms of their understanding of Islam? Which strands and versions of Islam will appeal to them more? The mainstream ones or the more hardline ones? Again, we need to understand human psychology, right? When you are persecuted even a little bit, you like ideologies that seem to give you extra power, make you more elitist, make you look down at everybody else. And so, not surprisingly, I don't want to mention too explicitly, very hardline groups are popular amongst the youth, some of which are banned by the government. And of course, when you ban the group, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Even more popular. When the government bans the group, right? There's a group that wants to call for Khilafah all the time, right? That is the most common group in that land. And they have protests with their faces covered, waving the flag that we want the Khilafah. What do you think is going to happen when the fellow German people see this reality, right? Covering their faces and waving the flag and whatnot, and we want to establish the Khilafah and whatnot. I don't blame them because that's their education, that's their... But what is going to be the backlash? The backlash is, listen to this, one of the most popular political parties is a resurrection of the Nazi party. It's called the AFD. The AFD is now winning more and more elections. It is likely within a few years, it will be one of the largest parties. And they are a resurrection of Nazi party, but not against the other group, against us. And it's a two-way street because when that becomes more popular, the Muslims become even more some of them become even more radical. That feeds into them, that feeds into their vicious loop. And this was very painful to me. I asked them, how many politicians, you have 15%, how many politicians are representing Muslim interests? They said zero or maybe one out of all of us. I said, how is this possible? 15% and you don't even have a single person. And they told me a few months ago, in this debacle of, of what's happening in the Middle East, a few months ago, a Muslim was running for office. And I'm going to say this bluntly because it needs to be said here. We need to learn from this. Muslim was running, mashallah, votes coming, whatnot. They came to the masjid. They kind of, this group basically stood outside the masjid. Started protesting, giving flyers. It is haram to vote. This person's a kafir. He's running in a democratic election. And so they're running and the police had to be called because they're causing a chaos outside the, the masjid I was at. They told me this happened a few weeks ago that our Muslim candidate is running. We got the protest from the youth of our own community. You cannot run. It is kufr to run. It's haram to run. And we had to bring in the police because they're getting physical and whatnot. And then the media got involved. Now what do you think is going to happen when the media comes, right? So we have a lot of internal, and I say this, wallahi, not to, astaghfirullah, to make it worse amongst them, but to make us realize, to make us realize, like, how long are we going to have this debate? The people don't even view themselves as being a part of society. So what's going to happen then? Where are your rights going to go? And therefore, don't be surprised. In multiple municipalities, there are clear Islamophobic politicians. In multiple areas, they have attempted to ban the hijab. They've attempted to... Here's another point. Germany, churches and synagogues get funding from the government. 
mosques, zero funding. I said, how can this be fair? How is it fair for a secular land? You can go and, uh, and sue and whatnot. Nobody's done that. The mosques get zero funding and there's a special tax everybody pays. The state will help build the church. The state will help finance the synagogue. And if the Muslims came together legally, they could petition to get money because it's a general, you know, all faith-based communities, but they're not doing that. Why? Again, this internal issue, not coming, not coming together, not petitioning, not what not. And subhanAllah, in the last 11 months or 12 months, because of Palestine and Gaza, you realize out of all of the European countries, out of all of them, Germany is the most pro-Israel, the most pro-Israeli. There is not even any competition. And the reason for this is obvious. They think they need to make up for what they have done in World War II. Right? They feel that because of World War II, because of what our ancestors did, we have to be the most pro-Israeli. And this is reflected in their policies top down. To this day, Germany has not given even a modicum of humanity to the Palestinians. Not even a ishara, not even a gentle, nothing. To this day, they have always said Israel has rather to defend itself. And when the, 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 the issue started 11 months ago, 12 months ago, first thing Germany did, they banned protests for Palestine. Complete ban, blanket ban. The Muslims, alhamdulillah, at least they sued. And they told me a few months ago that has been lifted, but then with conditions. So they told me from the river to the sea, that phrase, if you had said it up until two weeks ago, you would be put in jail and fined. You could not say it. Then another court case, and they just got that lifted as well. That from the river to the sea is allowed to say. Palestinian flag was banned. They got that lifted as well. Everything the government, here's another difference. Their government has a very different system of laws than our government does. The government has the right to pass laws. And then if the, if the police or if the people challenge them, then the laws are withdrawn. But the government doesn't need too much approval. They can get it done. And so this is reflected in their anti-Palestinian policies. What the government has now done, basically, basically, began to intimidate the Muslim community. It was very sad for me to hear that what this entity does, what the government is like a secret police, if any person is becoming too active, if they're giving Palestinian protests on Facebook or whatever, because look, Germany is supposed to be a democracy, supposed to be freedom, technically. But here's how that country is different than ours. And this is so sinister, wallahi. The friend told me this, that if you're active, the police will call your boss. The police will literally call your boss and say, we want you to know that your employee is being investigated. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. That's it. We want you to know so-and-so, he's on a list, and we're just looking at his record. That's it. Now, what's going to happen? You tell me. You're going to get let off the next time. Get the, the intimidate. Now, you cannot sue the police because what, what, what have they done? They've intimidated, but they haven't literally said anything, right? You're not being charged with a crime. It's just like we're investigating him. And that's why the entire, and I asked him permission. I said, can I say this on your behalf? I asked, I went to multiple cities. Every city I met with the shiuch and scholars there. Every city I spoke with the activists there. They all said the same thing. We are under a climate of fear. We are under a climate of fear. We're worried about what to say. Not physically, you're going to get dragged off, but we're going to lose our jobs. And like I told you, even my lectures, I was like never, in no country is this the case. They couldn't hire a hall for me. A thousand people coming, 800 people coming. There's no space. Why? Because anytime we say Islamic lecture, they don't even care who it is. No university and no hotel. It's like I said to them, Yaqi, this looks like what happened 1920s to the other group. Looks like that intimidation is happening to you guys. The irony, out of running away from what they did, what are they doing? Do you understand? I cannot be too explicit. You understand what I'm saying here? The irony out of running away from what they did back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, right? It's not as bad as 1940 yet, but wallahi, this is 1920. 
like a hundred years ago. Where? That second class. Where? If you're a Muslim, that separation begins. Where? The mark is very clear. Social pressure, education pressure, job pressure. And it hurt me. So many questions were about hijrah. Can we leave? Should we leave? Really hurt me. 15% of the city. And they're wondering, should we leave or not? And I said to them, I cannot tell you that because I don't live here. I don't know the pressures. But I'll tell you generically from the seerah. And with this we conclude, inshallah. Generically from the seerah, we learn. You stay in your land as long as you have the freedom to worship Allah. And you fight back within the system. And you keep on preaching and teaching. As of yet, it's a nuisance and irritation. You're not being physically persecuted. You're not being dragged away and, and thrown into jail. As of yet, it's intimidation. And if you were to combine together, if you were to get that 10-15%, you could create a ripple effect and a change. And they all recognize this. So I said, I cannot give you a specific verdict, but generically speaking, I said to them, my gut instinct would be, your main job right now is to mobilize, is to come together, is to tap in. No city has the entire Muslim community under one banner. They are divided ethnically, divided socially, divided into these firaq as well, unfortunately. And so this group of 10%, 15% is just a statistic on paper. I said to them, if you can get rid of the internal divisions and come together because your group is one and the Islamophobia is against all of you, if you can do this, then subhanAllah, what force can stop you? So I want to conclude with this point. First and foremost, we thank Allah for whatever issues we have here. Very different. We don't have 15%, no doubt about that. We're less than 1 or 2%. In Dallas, we're 1.7%, by the way, which is more than the rest of the country. Greater Dallas area, we're relatively higher than the rest of the But still, 1.7%. By the way, that's all of Dallas. Maybe Plano might be a little bit more. Somebody should do some surveys on this. I think Plano is probably 5%, I would assume. Like good amount. Plano is a good amount, inshallah. We are a relatively good percentage in this part of the country, but 15 is beyond our imagination. No part of the country is 15%. We benefit from them and then realize, oh Muslims, the whole world is having its own issues. There is no Jannah on earth. There is no Jannah. And I said to these brothers, Hijrah, where? Where? Name me a country. And they named a few and I pointed out problems in each one they named. For how long? For what? No. The general rule, as much as you can. You stay where you are and you fight for your rights and you preach and teach Islam and you make sure you're able to pass this religion down to your children. So I hope that, inshallah that was of some benefit to study about the Muslims of other lands. And I make dua for them and for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep our hearts united and cause us to benefit the ummah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.